Hello and welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. My name is Patrick Capon. I'm the Australian Biocommons Science Communication Officer and I will be your host for today. In this series, we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life science community. Each month we hear from local and international experts who present a bioinformatics topic that supports Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events through the channels that have been that are listed on your screen and we're in the, the waiting room. Before we begin today, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. For myself, this is the Turbul and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Georgie Samaha to answer the question that we've all been asking. What exactly is bioinformatics? Georgie is bioinformatics group lead at the Sydney Informatics Hub at University of Sydney. And she's passionate about making bioinformatics more accessible for researchers and is busy developing public digital infrastructure with biocommons. Since joining SIH, Georgie has worked on cancer genomics, rare heritable diseases, plant omics, and Australian wildlife research. She holds a PhD in genomics and runs an active research program focused on companion animal and wildlife genomics. Georgie's team work hard to develop collaborative data analysis and sharing solutions for the life sciences research community. And she's also leading the new BioCLI project at Biocommons. Welcome to the webinar, Georgie. I'll hand over to you to start your presentation. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, so yes, as Pat mentioned, um, I'm a bioinformatician at Sydney Informatics Hub. Um, my team provides the university's research community um, with support in doing uh, bioinformatics and um, kind of applying these techniques to their research. And we are also um, an official node of the um, Australian Biocommons as well. Um, uh, you know, my team, um, you know, we, we, we are now work with the Australian Biocommons. Um, as Pat mentioned, we're building some national digital infrastructure. Um, uh, our roles aren't academic positions, but um, they do have us consulting and working with different research projects and uh, building public resources like workflows and uh, helping researchers apply them to their own projects. Um, I actually a bit of a, a bioinformatics late bloomer and I came to bioinformatics um, out of necessity during my PhD. Um, when I started my PhD, I had a lot of assumptions about how easy it would be to do this work. Um, in all honesty, I was pretty naive and I fully intended to do some big and complicated work on uh, big mammalian genomes without ever needing to learn how to code because I didn't want to, um, or even use my institution's high performance computer. Um, those assumptions and, you know, the way I feel about this kind of work and my confidence, of course, has, um, you know, changed a lot as I've gotten deeper into this work. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, some have been more devastating than others, and um, I've developed my skills, but, you know, it's been a um, a really fun process for me. So today's webinar is going to be a reflection on my personal experiences in, in learning how to tackle all of this stuff. Um, as someone who wasn't, you know, naturally drawn to it initially, but, um, you know, who really enjoys their job and, and can't imagine uh, doing anything else. Um, so today I'm going to give you guys um, a bit of background and some practical tips that I think, you know, personally I would have found helpful when I was just starting out. We're going to talk through a few tri tricky definitions um, a typical experiment and the sorts of data that you're going to, to come across and, and, you know, generally what's involved in doing the work. So the focus is really going to be on giving you some context, um, uh, you know, on the sorts of things that you need to consider when, when doing these sorts of projects and experiments. Um, you know, when I started out, this was all quite overwhelming to me. So um, I've kind of tried to make it feel less intimidating and, and complicated. Um, but before we, we begin, um, I'd ask you all to uh, do something that I didn't do at, at the beginning of, of my journey um, and let go of any assumptions that you might have about how hard or easy this work is going to be. Um, the world of bioinformatics can be a pretty contradictory place. Um, you know, to me, it feels at times quite lawless, but also bound by um, a lot of unspoken uh, conventions and, and protocols. And I think... Um, you know, this is largely due to the fact that uh, biology is, is uh, cryptic and complex. 
um, and the field of bioinformatics is advancing quite fast in, in many different directions. Um, and, you know, of course, as with all scientific disciplines, people can be quite opinionated on, on how things should be done. So can you keep in mind that, you know, when we're talking about this kind of work, we're talking about many different organisms, many different research questions and technologies as well. So that means there's going to be differences in uh, how we design our experiments, uh, the quality and the type of data sets that are available to us, and the sorts of computational resources and platforms that we're going to be using, as well as the sorts of best practices or, or community standards that we're going to follow. So, um, you know, given all of that disorder, it's probably not surprising that coming up with a definition of what bioinformatics actually is can be a bit tricky. Um, you know, at a high level, you can think about it as the application of computational tools and processes um, to, you know, to process and analyze biological data. Um, more specifically, we're pretty much only talking about molecular biology here. So you're really thinking about nucleotides and proteins, amino acids and, and metabolites as well. Um, also keep in mind that it's an interdisciplinary field. It involves computer science, biology, mathematics, plenty of other stuff as well. Um, but that by no means needs, uh, means that you would need to be an expert in all of those things in order to do this work. Um, these things all just contribute to our functional understanding of um, you know, the intricate relationships and mechanisms within biological systems that we study. Um, and, you know, I think it's all, I think bioinformatics is, you know, essential to contemporary uh, biological and medical research. Um, you might also have heard the term computational biology and might be confused by the difference between it and bioinformatics. Um, if you're confused, you're not alone. I'm confused by it also at times, uh, and I think so is the general community. So even those of us who agree that they're different things uh, don't actually agree on on what makes them different. If you go down a rabbit hole on like Reddit or, or you know, Twitter or various other format, uh, forums, um, you'll see this kind of disagreement playing out. Um, if you're asking me, I consider, you know, bioinformatics to be focused more on upstream work like data processing and software development and computational biology to be focused on more downstream analysis and the application of existing software to do that. Um, but by heaps of other people's standards, that demarcation is wrong. Um, you know, in my team and lots of other research and professional bioinformaticians that we work with, we do both. We do bioinformatics and computational biology. So today I'm going to be talking about both and refer to it all basically under the same umbrella of bioinformatics because I think it's all uh, equally um, important. So depending on your background, you may have come across certain buzzwords related to bioinformatics. Um, you know, these days I feel like most of us have heard terms like SNP or personalized medicine or, or DNA tests. Um, in reality, I don't think bioinformatics is all that sexy. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, dry and complicated aspects of the work. Um, so firstly, you've got to think about the struggles and responsibilities of working with big and complex data. Um, unlike other big research data outputs, so other disciplines that produce big, big data sets like radio astronomy or climate simulations. Um, bioinformatics is not just big, but it's also really heterogeneous and, and noisy. Um, so, you know, that can, can create um, some issues there, can make it a bit hard to, to work with. Um, next, there are data privacy and governance restrictions that may or may not apply to you. Uh, it really depends on the source and the type of data you're working with. Um, navigating through these intricacies of compliance and ethical guidelines um, is something we all have to do in, in research, um, and it becomes a significant aspect of bio, uh, bioinformatics research uh, when you're dealing with, um, you know, protected data. So we're talking about human genomes or endangered species, things like that. Um, and finally, there are the struggles of code management. So ensuring that your methods are reproducible is essential for the credibility and the reliability of what you're doing. Um, Researchers often encounter challenges in maintaining well-documented and organized code bases, which um, are crucial for replicating results and facilitating collaboration. Um, and on top of that, you're usually juggling multiple tools or packages in order to just run a few steps in a method. Um, and handling the installation of all those things can be quite a burden as well. So I'd say these sort of things are sort of activities that make up a, a daily, uh, a day in the life of a bioinformatician. Um, uh, you know, and that would apply to both academic and professional or, or industry settings. Um, you know, you'll be doing different tasks from data analysis to uh, collaborating and meeting with others and, and doing some community engagement as well and data management. Um, much of the work um, I find doesn't necessarily in, involve you uh, sitting down and writing code all day. 
Um, a lot of it is involved, uh, is kind of focused on communication and working closely with others who are not bioinformaticians. Um, so, you know, we'll all be working with clinicians or geneticists and biologists to design and plan methods and implement them for specific projects. Um, in my group, the sorts of projects that we work on include bespoke analysis, um, scalable data processing, where say we're doing big batch processing of um, a number of genomes, say 100 genomes or something for someone. We also develop training events and we write uh, software, so we develop tools and workflows as well. Um, and we're also designing services for public infrastructure. So um, I've just got a QR code up here for, you know, if you're curious about what sort of public infrastructure work there is for a bioinformatician, um, I've just linked the Biocommons activity page here with all the different projects um, that lots of different partners across different organisations around Australia are working on with the Biocommons. Um, I spend more time than I ever thought I would managing and curating data. Uh, proper data management is really important, uh, absolutely essential, especially when you're working with big data sets where, um, you know, moving and processing it can uh, pose a lot of opportunities for you to accidentally lose or corrupt your data. Um, so the meat of, you know, the meat of daily work involves data processing and analysis, though. Um, and this includes running algorithms and statistical tests and other computational methods to extract some meaningful information from your data. Um, and like I said before, we use a lot of different software tools and programming languages um, in order to do this. Um, sometimes to get this work done, we need to develop custom algorithms or software to solve a specific problem or a specific, answer a specific question. Uh, this can be a really tricky thing to do. It requires some pretty advanced skills in coding and algorithm design, um, but it's not something that, that everyone does, every bioinformatician does, in my opinion. Um, and it can also include things like developing workflows and you know that might implement tools that, that others have developed as well. Um, but all in all, you know, all of us need to uh, maintain and update the code we use uh, to ensure everything remains functional um, and relatively um, efficient. Um, another thing I, I didn't think I'd spend so much time doing is, is writing useful documentation. Um, it's really important uh, for reproducibility and transparency. Um, it also helps us share our findings and methods with colleagues in the broader community. Um, and it's especially important for anyone who develops custom tools because people, of course, you know, they need to know how to use the tools that you, you, you're giving them. So. Um, you know, now that we've got some basics out of the way, um, I thought we could talk about what's involved in a, in a typical experiment. So, you know, if we think about this, while we're all going to be working with different data types and different analyses and processes, uh, we're largely all following standard protocol. Um, and I've made a very basic kind of cooking analogy here that might help you understand it, you know, keep it in your mind. Um, so we're all going to start with study design, where we decide what kind of data we need to answer our research question and the specific processes we need to apply to that data to extract answers um, for our research aims. Um, the next step is going to involve digitizing your chosen biological materials. So um, whether you, know, you want to be working with DNA, RNA, protein, or metabolites, you're going to need to convert that um, data into a format that can be analyzed by a computer. Um, and it's during this phase that biological samples are usually uh, quite fragmented and noisy. So this necessitates the next step, which is data pre-processing. And this is where bioinformatics really begins. Um, during this pre-processing phase, we're going to be converting that raw, fragmented, digitized data um, into a format that you can analyze. So this is an example. Um, this might involve, say you've, you've gotten some whole genome sequencing done. Um, this might involve you taking those sequencing reads, um, aligning them to a reference genome um, in order to create the, you know, the, the map, the genome map of the organism that you're working with. Um, once the data is in that form that, that adequately represents the original biological sequence, we can then analyze it. And, you know, of course, this encompasses all sorts of things that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, but really, the focus of our analysis is going to be um, on identifying patterns that can provide us with those insights into the biological questions at hand. Um, and once we have those potential insights, we then employ a few different techniques to contextualize our results, ensure they're actually reflective of the biology that we're looking at. Uh, we also validate our fi findings and also use this to kind of help us understand the results as well. So we're going to go through each step now, um, just one by one. Um, so starting an experimental or study design, um, this of course is always tricky. And, and in my experience, sometimes it changes throughout the course of the project. Um, you know, what you started out intending to do doesn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily where you end up. 
Um, so this is going to start by you clearly defining the research question, which sets the purpose of your project. You're then going to need to determine what data and what methods are going to get you an answer to that question. So what things are you going to measure? What will those measurements tell you? How much data do you need for your results to be statistically valid? Um, neglecting this step, uh, you know, or, or kind of not doing it very comprehensively can be quite an easy thing to do, an easy thing to overlook, especially when you're just getting started and you don't really have much of a sense of what the data looks like and how all of this stuff works, um, how you piece all these bits of the puzzle together. Um, but yeah, neglecting it can, um, you know, have some unfortunate consequences. So your aim at this point should be really to identify and control for variables that might influence your analysis and your, your conclusions. Um, generally, you're going to be dealing with pretty big data and it can be very easy to get lost in it all. So, um, you know, without this step, um, your project might lack some focus, your data might not be adequate to answer your questions, you might not have enough samples, or it might not be the right data type. Um, and those uncontrolled factors might invalidate your results. So at this planning stage, um, I'd say collaboration is really important. Um, you need to be on the same page as all the, the non-bioinformaticians that you're working with to make sure that, um, you know, you guys are heading in the right direction. Um, so, you know, after we've designed it, now we're going to talk about the kind of data and how you're going to collect your data. So, of course, there are many different data types available to us. This changes, um, you know, every year uh, people are developing novel types of, uh, you know, um, data sets that we can work with here. Um, all of these different data, data types give us insights into different aspects of biology. Um, you can organize them, you know, in different ways, depending on you know what they what they show you or, or the molecule the molecules that they reflect. Um, so if we think back to say the central dogma, right? Remembering back to like high school biology, you know DNA is going to make a copy of itself. The information that's encoded in DNA is going to be transcribed into messenger RNA. That RNA is going to be translated into proteins, and then we can think of metabolites at the end, uh, you know, as kind of the the products and, and regulators of this process. So of all the data types that are commonly used in bioinformatics um, that capture those kind of molecules, there are going to be a lot of ohms and omics that you might come across. Um, these are going to refer to high throughput technologies like sequencing and mass spectrometry, um, and they're going to capture the complete set of a particular molecule in a, in a tissue um, or an organism. Um, if you compare them with more selective approaches like, say, microarrays or 16S RNA sequencing, um, these high throughput techniques offer you a more holistic picture um, where the, and you know, they might be suited to projects where the aim is not just to focus on a specific region of the genome or a specific set of proteins or metabolites, um, but also where you want to look at more complex aspects of regulation and structural organization and interaction. Um, and also they're great for when you're trying to do kind of exploratory studies, not, not look at or confirm something you already know. So if we consider a, you know, a very simple project where say we're studying coat color genetics in cats, um, you know, we can think about the unique perspective each of these data types is going to provide us. So, you know, if I go and sequence uh, the genomes of a few different cats of different coat colors, I'm going to be able to see specific genetic variants that are associated with those different coat colors. And I'm also going to be able to, um, you know, depending on how many cats I sequence, I'm going to be able to create a picture of the mode of inheritance that's, have, that's um, kind of underlying this um, process. Um, but, you know, using uh, genomic DNA, I'm not going to be able to infer much functional information from this. For that, I'd need to look at gene expression data, maybe at the transcriptome or the proteome level, so RNA or proteins, um, and I'm going to have to look at that specifically in hair follicles to identify how variants in genes alter their expression levels and the, the proteins that they produce. So from, you know, transcriptome and proteome data, we can infer functional and regulatory mechanisms. Um, and, you know, things like key structural proteins and, and enzymes that play a role in, say, melanin formation, which is going to determine coat color. Um, beyond that, I could, uh, you know, analyze the metabolome in order to clarify pigment synthesis pathway information and some other stuff about metabolic activity and how this varies with different coat colors. Um, I'm definitely not saying here that you need to collect all these different data types to answer a question like this, um, but just highlighting their, their unique application. Um, you know, that being said, of course, a lot of people are using multi-omic techniques where they integrate um, these different data types into the same experiment, and they can be a great way to address projects that have um, many different layers to them. So um, there's going to be a few questions you've got to ask yourself when you're collecting data, and it's really important that you keep in mind here that your choice um, is going to be relevant to and reflect the biology. 
um, and, and the research questions that you're asking. So if we think back to that uh, coat color example, um, I'd be making a mistake if I, uh, you know, didn't, if I took RNA from any other tissue other than a hair follicle, right? Um, um, and I, I also would be making a mistake if I didn't, um, I didn't collect enough biological replicates because that would affect the statistical significance um, of my results. Um, on top of that, you're going to need to ensure that you're collecting data that is, uh, is of a suitable quality. Um, poor quality data can introduce noise and reduce the st statistical power um, of your experiments. So it's really important that when you're extracting, say, RNA from a tissue, that you avoid things like DNA contamination. So this is where wet lab work comes in. It's very important here. Um, you know, you need to be, if you're getting some data sequenced yourself, you're going to need to follow the, the kind of recommendations by your sequencing provider in terms of things like the minimum yield of RNA um, that you need in order to get a high quality sequence. Um, additionally, of course, um, cost efficiency and working within your budget, something that is you know, completely unavoidable. Um, sometimes it can be, it can appear to be fiscally prudent to reduce the number of samples that you collect. Um, but by doing this, you might risk reducing the statistical power of your analysis. And this can be a really hard thing for you to work out yourself sometimes. So, um, you know, if you're having, uh, if you're struggling with this, you should go and talk to a biostatistician or, or a bioinformatician about this and they'll be able to um, advise you. Um, and finally, ethical considerations um, that we kind of mentioned before also play a really important role in data acquisition. So it's your responsibility to adhere to the relevant uh, ethics agreements and guidelines um, uh, for collecting and storaging and managing your research data. We all have to do that. Um, and it's going to be especially important or might be a bit more, a bit trickier for those of us who are working with protected data like clinical, clinical samples, uh, where we may face uh, limitations about how it's collected or where it can be stored and, and who can access it as well. So once you've decided on the, the type of data that you need, you're going to need to go and find it. And uh, you don't just need to find data to analyze, you're also going to need reference data to help you process and, and analyze and contextualize your primary data set as well. So if we focus first on, on collecting your primary data set, you can source this from a few different places. So you could go to a sequencing company or a mass spectrometry facility and pay them to generate data for you. Um, alternatively, or perhaps to complement your primary data set, your own sequencing um, and increase your sample numbers or something like that, you can also source others, uh, other you know, data sets um, from public repositories. So you might have noticed that um, it's increasingly a requirement of uh, you know, publications that you release your data publicly. Um, when people do this in, in this field, they tend to release their data on platforms like the Sequence Read Archive, um, the European Nucleotide Archive, and the Geo and Gene Expression Omnibus. Um, and you know, there's a lot of data out there for you to use, um, and I highly recommend uh, you kind of explore these databases. Um, so then, you know, we talked about the primary data set and your ability to collect that. Um, you're also going to need um, that reference material. So we're talking about things like reference genomes, gene and variant annotations as well. Um, and these data sets are going to uh, be essential for you to do certain types of data processing um, and analysis as well. So these things are publicly available, um, but unfortunately, um, they can be quite limited in their availability for non-model species. Um, things are, are changing um, in terms of, you know, the avail wider availability of these data sets, um, but there's a lot of big um, international consortia that are, um, that are producing these reference data sets for underrepresented um, organisms. Um, um, but yes, just keep in mind that uh, you know, what's available for the best resourced organism, humans, is not going to necessarily um, be available for, um, you know, a, a tiny population of, of bird, you know, some kind of species of bird or something like that. Um, so, yeah, all in all, there's a lot of public resources available for you, uh, a lot of public data out there, um, and, you know, you guys should, should make the most of it. Um, of all those different raw sequence and, and reference and annotation data sets, um, is they're all going to come in you know, different formats. These formats generally adhere to standards that have been created and updated over time by the bioinformatics community. Um, and this ensures that they're consistent and interoperable. So this means that they can be used as inputs for multiple tools and output in the same standard. Um, the definitions of, of more widely used standards like FASTQ or VCF or, or BAM files, um, these are published online and they're very, very easy for you to Google. 
um, you know, if if you're new to this stuff, I appreciate it can definitely be um, kind of intimidating, can be a challenge to get your head around these different formats. They're actually not as complicated as they seem once you you really you know get into them and you have a look at them. Um, generally, they are text files, so you can read them yourself. You can interact with them. Um, sometimes they're going to contain a bit of metadata um, that might tell you something about how they were produced or certain things that have um, processes that yeah have been applied to the data, um, as well as whatever sequencing um, sequencing data they're they're carrying as well. I think it's definitely beneficial for you to look at your files, get a feel for what they contain, um, and where the pertinent information is before you start, um, you know, the the uh, applying your methods to them. So if we get back to our typical experiment, now that we've handled those important attributes of, you know, uh, designing your experiment and acquiring your data, um, we're starting with the first step of, of bioinformatics, really, which is data pre-processing. Um, and even though we might be dealing with very different data types and formats. The general steps that we need to take to prepare them for analysis is going to be pretty consistent, especially when we're starting from the raw sequence data itself. So generally, we're going to need to assess the quality of our data and identify issues that might compromise our analysis. We're going to need to filter out any low quality data points, remove noise that's going to interfere with you know, our results. Um, and remembering this for the next part that you know our sequencing data usually comes to us in a fragmented form. So we're going to reconstruct it to infer that original sequence at this step um, before, or maybe its structure, um, before we can actually identify any biologically relevant features. So on the right here, I've got some examples of, of what this looks like for genomics and proteomics and single cell RNA-seq data, just at a very basic level. Um, and while different things are happening under the hood for each process, you can still see that we're following the same workflow. So we're still doing quality control. We're still, like, still looking at how good the data is. We're still cleaning it up. We're still reconstructing, reconstructing it and identifying some features as well. Um, a practical consideration here that you might not be aware of if you haven't done this work before is that um, we treat these steps as separate from one another, and we generally need to use different uh, reference data um, and different pieces of software to create each step as well. So once we've got our, our data ready for analysis, we can get on with applying statistical methods and algorithms to infer some, you know, make some insights. Um, and this can obviously cover a huge array of different methods, but no matter what method you're applying to which kind of data, um, you've just got to keep in mind that your methods have to accurately reflect the biological reality and your methods have to be statistically robust as well. Um, another thing to consider is, um, you know, and this also applies to data pre-processing, is the impact that data complexity and, and scale, so how big it is, um, the impact that can have on the computational resources you're going to need um, to process your data. So um, because these data sets are so big and complicated, you often need to apply quite complicated algorithms um, to work with them. Um, and these are really computationally greedy. So that means they need large amounts of disk space to store the data, a lot of RAM and also possibly CPUs to process the data. Um, and this is something we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Um, but it's, you know, it's unavoidable, especially when you're working with, um, with large scale data sets. So at this final stage, um, generally in our analysis, you know, it might have returned a, a list of genes that we're interested in or markers or, you know, variants or proteins or something. Um, and we need to link this list or, you know, these features to relevant biological processes or cellular components or molecular functions that we're interested in. Um, I personally find this step to be the most fun. Um, but, you know, it is quite tricky. Um, it can be, you know, I guess it requires a bit of creative thinking sometimes. It can be quite manual and a bit back and forth um, and involves a lot of uh, literature reviews and searching online in order to kind of construct a nice, a nice story that makes sense and, and make sure everything makes sense. Um, so when we have these features, we can connect them to all sorts of functional annotations that are publicly available. So um, you might have heard of gene ontologies. These are um, different functional and structural categories that we can use to group genes into general themes. Um, we can also look at metabolic pathways through sources like CAG databases to kind of um, connect those features to specific biological processes as well. Um, and we can also look at contextualize our results by thinking about where they sit in the broader population. So this is especially useful for, um, say, variant data sets where Maybe you want to know whether or not the, the mutations that you've identified are actually common or, or they're rare in the broader population, or 
maybe you're interested in looking at them in specific, or, you know, geographical or, or ethnic groups as well. Um, another thing we can do um, is sometimes kind of infer the, the effect that, let's say we're talking about a variant here, um, uh, infer what kind of effect it might have on, on normal function. Um, and we can do this through pathogenicity scores. So again, just like with reference and annotation data sets, these sorts of functional annotations um, are publicly available, but they're not going to be widely available um, for all organisms. Humans are typically going to be best supported, um, but you know I found there are plenty of workarounds, and, and often when you're working with non-model species, uh, we can make certain assumptions about annotations that might be available for um, closely related and, and better supported species as well. So you know now that we've covered that kind of process, we have that inevitable question, but you know easy to, to overlook question of where are you going to do the work. So there's a lot of different interfaces and infrastructures for you to work on, and you often need to use different these different platforms across the course of the same experiment or project. So you're going to be working on different platforms or you know for different reasons, and that's going to depend on your preference for writing code or, or using a graphical interface, your you know requirement for you to write custom code or run someone else's uh, workflow or something like that whether or not you need to visualize your data. Um, and also another consideration is, you know, what platforms and services might be available to you or provided by your institution um, that you might be able to use. Um, but generally speaking, we kind of group uh, the interfaces that people use in bioinformatics into two groups. Um, you can think about it as first one is a graphical user interface. Um, and the second one is a command line interface. And there are a few considerations um, a few things to consider when, when choosing which one to use. So those graphical interfaces, they can be both open source and commercial. Um, they are particularly suitable for beginners and those less familiar with coding. Um, they are great for you know, doing visualizations and, and they're, they're far more user friendly sometimes. Um, but with all those friendly features come some trade-offs. So they tend to be suited for smaller scale work that's less computationally intensive. Um, typically, you can use these interfaces like, say, uh, RStudio or CLC Genomics or Jupyter um, on your own computer, which means that um, the sorts of computing resources that are available to you, so RAM, CPUs, and disk space, they're going to be limited to what's on your local machine. Um, when you're working on web-based uh, graphical platforms, maybe like Galaxy, um, you're going to have access to much more computing resources. So you might be able to do more computationally intensive work like data processing or, or working with a bigger data set or something like that. Um, in contrast, the command line can be, uh, you know, a lot of the time people find it quite a scary place to work. Um, it's definitely got a steep learning curve. Um, you can use it, of course, to work on your local computer, but you're also going to have to use the command line interface to access most high performance computers and, and cloud computing platforms. Um, you know, in order to do this, you're going to need to know how to navigate a Linux environment, manage your own software installations, um, but all of that can really pay off in terms of the high flexibility and versatility it affords you. So you're definitely going to be, definitely going to be able to customize things a lot more um, if you're working on the command line. So that's a lot of information um, to take in and not much direction on, I guess, exactly how to do all of that stuff. So I guess, like I said at the beginning, something I found really challenging when I was getting started was that, yeah, it felt like there were a lot of unspoken rules about how things were done. Um, so as biologists or clinicians, we don't typically receive formal computational training. So you don't necessarily know how to use these big machines like high performance computing and high performance computers and cloud computing. Um, so to kind of help you implement these things, um, I've just got a few practical tips to wrap up with. And these are things that have definitely made me feel more comfortable and confident in doing this kind of work. So my first tip is that there is no one size fits all solution. Um, and we talked about this a bit at the beginning, but you know the diversity in our data and the applications um, that we're using uh, means that we each actually face quite a unique set of circumstances, which may require a customized approach. So this is something I definitely didn't appreciate when I started out. I did things like, you know, uh, Google the, you know, tutorials online that might describe a particular protocol. Um, I wasn't thinking too hard about it. And I was, you know, thinking, looking at uh, protocols for microbes. And I honestly thought that while, you know, some of the details might change, um, it should roughly follow the same for mammals, and of course it, it doesn't. Um, and it especially didn't occur to me that uh, it would take as much time as it does to 
to process um, uh, you know a three gigabase genome so um, when you're doing this kind of stuff you know keep it in the back of your mind think about the range of genome sizes and complexities across different organisms so biology is very very complicated and diverse right um, even when you're talking in the in the same class of organisms and this is going to have a dramatic effect on the compute resources you're going to need um, and the differences you know these differences will determine whether or not you can work on a local computer or you're going to need to access scalable resources on hpc or cloud um, on top of that your experience level or your coding ability uh, might limit where you feel comfortable working and it might mean that your processing is quite a lot slower than someone else who has access to bigger computers and more flexible environments and really knows how to wrangle them so um, yeah just keep that in mind that what works for someone else is not necessarily going to work out for you so continuing on from that um, if you're considering learning to write code um, and you know you're not actually a programmer um, you know I'd remind you that to start out with you're a scientist you're not a programmer um, and sure if you become a bioinformatician who develops tools and workflows you're going to need to learn to write efficient and optimized code but as a researcher and as someone who's just starting out or does this kind of work intermittently your primary focus should really be on ensuring that you understand and you can reproduce your methods before anything else before you do anything else you know, I personally think of um, coding skills as a means to an end. I am not particularly enamored with the intricacies of Python or other computing languages like my colleagues are. Um, I started learning, you know, the way I started out with all of this was I started learning some basic bash, which helped me navigate the command line and work on a high performance computer. I then learned some R and a little bit of Python by applying them to practical and meaningful situations like extracting data from files and visualizing my data and um annotating it things like that so starting out with like small and manageable tasks i found was a, a great way um to kind of build my confidence before i started tackling more complex challenges and i, I kind of built so I, I built on my experience um you know throughout my career um, another thing that is particularly important in the researcher context is to prioritize functionality in your code and not worry too much about efficiency until you really need to so as you gain experience, you can learn to refine your code better. You can you can optimize things, but your focus initially should really be on developing, um, you know, a solid understanding of the logic of your code and getting things working at a really uh, basic level. So my next tip is to not feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. So this work can definitely feel a bit lonely, especially when you're the maybe the only person doing bioinformatics in your research group. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd remind you that the bioinformatics community is very collaborative and open and there's a lot of resources online. You just you really just have to know where to find help. So when I have a problem with something, if I'm trying to apply a new method or, you know, I'm just curious about something, I Google it straight away. Um, there are a lot of communities and resources out there. If you're troubleshooting an issue or planning an experiment or learning a new technique, um, you know, I guarantee you that you can find the answer for whatever your questions are online. Um, and if you have questions or need support, you can talk with services at, say, your institution, like the Sydney Informatics Hub or whatever the equivalent is at, at your institution. You can also engage with online forums like Biostars or Stack Overflow and Seek Answers. Um, uh, usually whenever I'm Googling my way through an issue or a, a question, um, similar, if not same problems or questions have been asked in these forums and they will appear in my Google search results. Um, there's also a lot of training material and, and free events online, like this one, for example, like what the Biocommons provides, um, that offer some, you know, pretty valuable opportunities for you to build your skills. Um, there are also other providers like the Carpentries and Galaxy Training and uh, Emble EBI that might provide self-directed materials on a diverse range of topics. Um, I provided a link here to uh, a resource library that my group is building, um, and you know, for our own use. Uh, but also for the consultation work we do with researchers where we kind of get the same questions over and over again um, and we kind of point people in the direction of the same resources repeatedly so in terms of actually doing your data processing analysis you definitely don't need to be writing custom code all the time there's a lot of great software out there and the vast majority of it is open source so that means freely available to you um, I'd say that managing software is one of the biggest challenges that you're going to face when you're doing this work just because you've got to often install so many different tools um, so I highly recommend that you use software management tools like containers and R packages and Bioconda. 
Um, you also don't even have to write your own workflows um, if you don't want to these days. So if you're doing, say, standard data processing that uses best practice tools um, and methods, you know, more and more people are, are sharing their workflows and, and using workflow management systems like um, Nextflow and, and their NF Core workflows and Galaxy as well. Um, even for writing your own custom code or workflows, you can find and reuse and borrow other people's code if you go on platforms like GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, I find that exploring and using other people's code can save me a lot of time, can offer me different perspectives for how to write the code and, and how to do something, um, and also saves me a lot of time and, you know, involved in having to start from scratch. Um, so if you're going to engage with, you know, the kind of communities and the online uh, network that we were just talking about, um, you're going to need to learn how to ask questions. Um, so keep in mind that there are, you know, lots of different ways to do the same task. Um, so you're going to need to be really specific about your circumstances when you're when you're asking questions. So again, my first port of call for any questions I have is always Google. Um, if you're troubleshooting an issue in someone else's code or a tool and, and you find a bug, um, your best bet is going to be uh, to, to contact that person who developed that tool or wrote that code. Um, a lot of bioinformatics tools, um, like a lot of their code is, is hosted on platforms like GitHub. Um, and people regularly um, can use, there's a, an issues feature on GitHub that you can use to ask questions of the developer and, and talk to other people um, um, using those tools as well. Um, the best way to get an answer to your question in this context is to provide specific technical details that anyone is else is gonna need to understand the source of your problem, reproduce it and help you resolve it as well. Um, if you say have questions that might be more generic, uh, let's say they're about a method or your experiment, or you might wanna get involved in some of those community forums. Um, here again, I think context is key. Asking specific questions and listing important considerations is most likely gonna get a discussion going and, and get you the answers that you're looking for. Um, and if you need some other general support, you know, you can always go and talk with bioinformaticians like me and, and my colleagues or, or someone you work with. Um, again, same as the previous point, will be much more useful to you if we have some context and can understand what you're trying to achieve, what your circumstances are and the problems that you're facing as well. Um, and this is my final tip, um, and it's really about managing yourself. So um, this is probably something that holds true for, for any lab work you're doing, I'm sure. Um, and it's to not trust your future self to remember anything. So, you know, I'd advise that you document things and your work as comprehensively um, as you can. And there are a few ways you can do this. Um, you can write your comments in your code. So there are line, you can write lines in code that, you know, explains what the code underneath it is doing. Um, you can also keep a notebook that describes, you know, or documents the choices you made, the issues you experienced and uh, how you troubleshooted them and, and why you've decided to implement your method this way. Um, there have been, you know, so many times where I spent hours troubleshooting something. I tell myself, I'll definitely remember how because it was so annoying. And within, you know, a week, I've forgotten everything. Um, and I've somehow gotten myself back to that same point where I'm facing the same problem and I have to start from scratch in, in my troubleshooting. So um, I like to keep a note, a set of notes um, alongside my code. Um, I use a, a language called Markdown to do that. It's, it's just a basic text file. Um, you can interact with it programmatically if you want to. It doesn't auto format things like a Word document or Excel might. Um, yeah, I find it, I find it very useful. Um, so, uh, you know, in addition to documenting things, you can also manage these sort of issues by, uh, you know, in the way you write your code. So you can uh, version control it. So ensure that you're using the same tool versions um, and save your working code to platforms like GitHub so you don't lose it or overwrite it. Um, and you can also implement some simple tests into your code um, to ensure that it's doing exactly what it should be doing. Um, so I think here, simple things can be really useful um, uh, and really helpful for you and save you a lot of time and, and stress in the long run. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I know that was a lot of information to absorb, um, but really, you know, my intention was to just get you guys thinking broadly about bioinformatics. Um, you know, my biggest takeaways are to remember that it's going to be messy um, and that you need to kind of uh, be okay with that and not get too stressed out by it. Um, but the fact that it's it can be messy and complicated, it often means that you need big computing resources, quite complicated tools, a lot of different tools in order to do the work. 
um, the resources and tools and data that you're going to use um, are going to be dependent on your projects and your research questions and on your own preferences as well. Um, it's really important that you are careful about collecting the right type and amount of data to make sure that your project is going to be successful in the end. Um, and you know, keep in mind that you're generally always going to need to follow the same process um, throughout a project. You're going to need to clean and process and analyze and contextualize your results, no matter uh, you know, kind of what, what your project um, involves, what your research question involves. Um, and that you know, there are a lot of tools and resources available to you to help you do that. Um, it's just not necessarily very obvious um, or clear what these tools and resources are. So, you know, the most important thing uh, takeaway I think is um, talk to people with experience, Google things, um, and and have a go as well. So yeah, that's it. Thanks, Pat. Thanks very much, Georgie. That was excellent. A really really great introduction, and and welcome to the world of bioinformatics. And I'm glad that uh, you've you've been able to adjust everyone's expectations from perfection to to reality. Um. So we've got time for questions. Um, please pop them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll get started, Georgie, with, do you think you strictly need to learn programming to get started in bioinformatics? And maybe if you're gonna pick just one programming language, what, what would you choose? Okay, uh, that's, that second part is, gonna get me in trouble Pat um <laughs> I would say I would say that to get started no I don't think you need to learn how to code um I think you could use platforms like Galaxy um to kind of get familiar with all this stuff I think though um if you want to be a bioinformatician then yes you will need to learn how to code but that can be learned through practice um and in terms of a, a language to start with um I would say start with some basic bash. Um, it, it, you know, the choice of language really depends on where you work. So if you're someone who's kind of doing a lot of analysis, um, R or Python might be better for you. Um, but if you're someone who's got to do, um, say you've got to, depending on the platform you've got to work on, if you're working on a high performance computer um, or you're doing a lot of data processing, being able to, to write some bash and, and navigate a Linux environment is going to be really, really helpful for you. And would you say that, like, more most importantly, you need to be able to understand the logic behind the code? Like you, you said that in your presentation. Do you have any tips on on how to do that? Is it is it like you say, have a conversation with ChatGPT? Yeah, I think um, yeah, start start simple, um, kind of build up your your skills, um, and yeah, through doing, like, through writing your code, through commenting your code, so making you know making it clear to yourself that you can you can read exactly what it's doing rather than you having to to infer and remember what it all means. Um, yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Cool. Thanks, Georgie. Um, so obviously, if you're being welcomed into this world of bioinformatics, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, maybe do you have a few recommended places for, for getting started in, in learning? So, you know, do you, you have a favorite collection, something, anything like that? Of any, like all of it? Yeah, oh, any sort of like resources to, to learn how to how to get yourself going in the world of bioinformatics, I suppose. I think it would depend on what you're doing and where you need to do it. Um, so I would I would start out with um, if, if, you know, you have a project in mind or something, like I think that would be the best place to start. Um, have a think about um, the sort of data that you need. Um, and therefore, you know, where you're going to be able to work. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, lists available um, online. There's a lot of training available online. So, you know, things like software carpentries um, for training. Um, I think Biocommons has a great training series. Um, I think if you're looking for uh, things like bioinformatic workflows, um, you could be having a look at Galaxy where they publish their workflows. Um, you could also look at NF Core that publishes a lot of workflows. So yeah, I think it, it you should start small and start with a particular focus um, and a particular project, and that might help you narrow narrow what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. There's there's such a world out there that yeah, keeping that that narrow focus is definitely going to help people out. Um, 
so we might we might change tack and, and ask you more about your your day job i suppose can you tell us what your favorite part of being a bioinformatician is oh. um i i find it and this is me i think that other people in my team have very different um opinions on this um i like how much i get to work with other people who are not bioinformaticians so i do a lot of work with uh software engineers um but also you know researchers um, and so I find that that collaboration um, for me is the most fun um, part of the job. But I think, you know, my colleagues, some of my colleagues would tell you that they absolutely love getting stuck into a technical problem, um, you know, and being on the command line and writing quite complex commands and uh, some, yeah, complex scripts. They love that kind of stuff. Awesome. So I, mean, I guess that's good in a way because it shows you that like bioinformatics, you can really make make what you want of it as well and you can take your own path. Um, so maybe along those lines, do you, if you if you don't have a bioinformatics degree and and you don't make new tools, do you think you can call yourself a bioinformatician? Maybe I'm getting you in trouble again. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I think you can if you're if you're doing it, like if you're um, if you're working with these data sets and you know you're using other people's tools um, to to process and analyze them. Um, I, I I don't have a a bioinformatics degree. I don't think there are many out there in Australia currently. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the work and the, the best learning you do is practical hands-on learning that, you know, you just develop uh, with experience. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that that is not, um, not having a degree and, uh, you know, maybe not being someone who develops very complex algorithms or, or unique pieces of software, um, that shouldn't deter you, yeah. Cool. So yeah, it's not it's not a case of of requiring you know a specific thing on your CV that says this is a bioinformatician. No, I don't think so. Not at, not at this stage. I don't think. Nice, awesome. All right, I'm um, just flicking through some more questions here. Please keep them coming in in the Q and A if there are any more. Um, when we're looking to get advice on a on a bioinformatics project, um. At what point do you want people to to be coming to a service like SAH? Um, you know, so you what would you ask that they've sort of had a go at before they they approach you for for help? I think if you know if you're coming to us to ask for help with a project that you're doing kind of holistically, um, I would say just reach out very early on before you've collected your data, um, and you can always confirm. There's lots of core facilities at different universities and institutions around the country who can. Um, advise you on, um, you know, or, you know, help you confirm whether or not your experimental design is kind of set up well. Um, if you're getting started, um, I think if if you're if you've had, you know, you're coming to us to ask for our help in troubleshooting a problem, um, the sorts of things that would be really helpful there are uh, what you're exactly doing, the code you're running, um, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I guess it really depends on what you're asking for, what kind of help you're asking for. Yeah, but the the I think the the message there is that the door is open. If you, if you need yes. help, you're always welcome to ask. Yes, always. Awesome. <laughs> Someone's asking uh, for help defining whether they are a computational biologist or a bioinformatician. So, if they are working on raw sequencing data and they came up with the research question and they're doing the downstream analyses, what what, what bucket uh, do they belong in? Gosh. Both both buckets don't. I don't think I don't think you should worry about it too much because you'll look at job descriptions and like you know you're applying for jobs. You look at job descriptions. They'll have the same skills and requirements and responsibilities for jobs that are titled computational biologist versus bioinformatician. Um, I don't think it. I don't actually think it matters that much. Don't, yeah. I just don't stress about it. That, and that's really good advice too for if you're looking for a, a job in this space to to be searching in in both buckets. Don't don't limit yourself to just yeah. one area. Yeah, fantastic. All right, I am going to share my screen again, Georgie. Okay, so it remains for me to thank Georgie once again for a fantastic webinar and and welcome to the wide wonderful world of bioinformatics. Thank you very much. Um, if you're keen to find out more. Uh, we've got a few upcoming events at Australian Biocommons that might interest you. So you can get started using Galaxy Australia for your bioinformatics data analysis at our 
Introduction to Galaxy event. And also a bit later through September and October, we're going to have a rolling drop-in session where the Galaxy Australia team are going to come along and share their top tips with you. Um, and of course, you can keep up to date with all of the upcoming webinars and workshops that Biocommons are offering on our website. And you can watch recordings of our previous events on our YouTube channel. And lastly, we'd like to acknowledge our funding. So Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks very much for, for joining us today. And thank you, Georgie, once again. Really hope everyone's enjoyed today's presentation and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Until next time, goodbye for now.